The Civil War in France by Karl Marx, Chapter 5, The Paris Commune. On the dawn of March 18th, Paris arose to the thunderburst of Viva la Commune. What is the commune, that sphinx so tantalizing to the bourgeois mind? The proletarians of Paris, said the Central Committee in its manifesto of March 18th, amidst the failures and treasons of the ruling classes, have understood that the hour has struck for them to save the situation by taking into their own hands the direction of public affairs. They have understood that it is their imperious duty and their absolute right to render themselves masters of their own destinies by seizing upon the governmental power. But the working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and wield it for its own purposes. The centralized state power with its ubiquitous organs of standing army, police, bureaucracy, clergy, and juridic juridicur, jurid, fuck, <sighs> juridicature, organs wrought after the plan of a systematic and hierarchic division of labor, originates from the days of absolute monarchy, serving nascent middle-class society as a mighty weapon in its struggle against feudalism. Still, its development remained clogged by all manner of medieval rubbish, seigneurial rights, local privileges, municipal and guild monopolies, and provincial constitutions. The gigantic broom of the French Revolution of the 18th century swept away all these relics of bygone times, thus clearing simultaneously the social soil of its last hindrances to the superstructure of the modern state edifice raised under the First Empire itself the offspring of the coalition wars of old semi-feudal Europe against modern France. During the subsequent regimes, the government placed under parliamentary control, that is, under the direct control of the propertied classes, became not only a hotbed of huge national debts and crushing taxes, with its irresistible allurements of place, pelf, and patronage, it became not only the bone of contention between the rival factions and adventurers of the ruling classes, but its political character changed simultaneously with the economic changes of society. At the same pace at which the progress of modern industry developed, widened, intensified the class antagonism between capital and labor, the state power assumed more and more the character of the national power of capital over labor of a public force organized for social enslavement, of an engine of class despotism. After every revolution marking a progressive phase in the class struggle, the purely repressive character of the state power stands out in bolder and bolder relief. The revolution of 1830, resulting in the transfer of government from the landlords to the capitalists, transferred it from the more remote to the more direct antagonists of the working men. The bourgeois republicans, who in the name of the February Revolution took the state power, used it for the June 1848 massacres in order to con convince the working class that social republic means the republic entrusting their social subjection, and in order to convince the royalist bulk of the bourgeois and landlord class that they might safely leave the cares and um, emoluments of government to the bourgeois republicans. However, after their one heroic exploit of June, the bourgeois republicans had, from the front, to fall back to the rear of the party of order, a combination formed by all the rival fractions and factions of the appropriating classes. The proper form of their joint stock government was the parliamentary republic, with Louis Bonaparte for its president. Theirs was a regime of avowed class terrorism and deliberate insult towards the vile multitude. If the parliamentary republic, as M. Thiers said, divided them, the different fractions of the ruling class least, it opened an abyss between that class and the whole body of society outside their spare ranks. The restraints by which their own divisions had under former regimes still checked the state power were removed by their union, and in view of the threatening upheaval of the proletariat, 
they now used that state power mercilessly and ostentatiously as the national war engine of capital against labor. In their uninterrupted crusade against the producing masses, they were, however, bound not only to invest the executive with continually increased powers of repression, but at the same time to divest their own parliamentary stronghold, the National Assembly, one by one of all its own means of defense against the executive. The executive in the person of Louis Bonaparte turned them out. The natural offspring of the party of order republic was the second empire. The empire with the coup d'etat for its birth certificate, universal suffrage for its sanction and the sword for its scepter professed to rest upon the peasantry, the large mass of producers not directly involved in the struggle of capital and labor. It professed to save the working class by breaking down parliamentarism and with it the undisguised subserviency of government to the property classes. It professed to save the property classes by upholding their economic supremacy over the working class. And finally, it professed to unite all classes by reviving for all the chimera of national glory. In reality, it was the only form of government possible at a time when the bourgeoisie had already lost and the working class had not yet acquired the faculty of ruling the nation. It was acclaimed throughout the world as the savior of society. Under its sway, bourgeois society, freed from political cares, attained a development unexpected even by itself. Its industry and commerce expanded to colossal dimensions. Financial swindling celebrated cosmopolitan orgies. The misery of the masses was set off by a shameless display of gorgeous, meretricious, and debased luxury. The state power, apparently soaring high above society and the very hotbed of all its corruptions, its own rottenness and the rottenness of the society it had saved, were laid bare by the bayonet of Prussia, herself eagerly bent upon transferring the supreme seat of that regime from Paris to Berlin. Imperialism is, at the same time, the most prostitute and the ultimate form of the state power which nascent middle-class society had commenced to elaborate as a means of its own emancipation from feudalism, and which full-grown bourgeois society had finally transformed into a means for the enslavement of labor by capital. The direct antithesis to the empire was the commune, the cry of social republic, with which the February Revolution was ushered in by the Paris proletariat, did but express a vague aspiration after a republic that was not only to supersede the monarchical form of class rule, but class rule itself. The commune was the positive form of that republic. Paris, the central seat of the old governmental power, and at the same time, the social stronghold of the French working class, had risen in arms against the attempt of fierce and the rurals to restore and perpetuate that old governmental power bequeathed to them by the empire. Paris could resist only because, in consequence of the siege, it had got rid of the army and replaced it by a national guard, the bulk of which consisted of working men. This fact was now to be transformed into an institution. The first decree of the commune, therefore, was the suppression of the standing army and the substitution for it of the armed people. The commune was formed of the municipal councillors chosen by universal suffrage in the various wards of the town, responsible and revocable at short terms. The majority of its members were naturally working men or acknowledged representatives of the working class. The commune was to be a working, not a parliamentary body, executive and legislative at the same time. Instead of continuing to be the agent of the central government, the police was at once stripped of its political attributes and turned into the responsible and, and at all times revocable agent of the commune. So were the officials of all other branches of the administration. From the members of the commune downwards, the public service had to be done at workmen's wage. The vested interests and the representation allowance of the high dignitaries of state disappeared along with the high dignitaries themselves. Public functions ceased to be the private property of the tools of the central government. Not only municipal administration, but the whole initiative hitherto exercised by the state 
was laid into the hands of the commune. Having once got rid of the standing army and the police, the physical force elements of the old government, the commune was anxious to break the spiritual force of repression, the parson power, by the disestablishment and disendowment of all churches as proprietary bodies. The priests were sent back to the recesses of private life, there to feed upon the alms of the faithful in imitation of their predecessors, the apostles. The whole of the educational institutions were open to the people gratuitously and at the same time cleared of all interference of church and state. Thus, not only was education made accessible to all, but science itself freed from the fetters which class prejudice and governmental force had imposed upon it. The judicial functionaries were to be divested of that sham independence which had put, which had but served to mask their abject subserviency to all succeeding governments, to which in turn they had taken and broken the oaths of allegiance, like the rest of public servants, magistrates, and judges were to be elective, responsible, and revocable. The Paris Commune was, of course, to serve as a model to all the great industrial centers of France, the communal regime once established in Paris and the secondary centers. The old centralized government would, be, would in the provinces too, have to give way to the self-government of the producers. In a rough sketch, sketch of national organization, which the commune had no time to develop, it states clearly that the commune was to be the political form of even the smallest country hamlet, and that in the rural districts, the standing army was to be replaced by a national militia, with an extremely short term of service. The rural communities of every district were to administer their common affairs by an assembly of delegates in the central town, and these district assemblies were again to send deputies to the national delegation in Paris, each delegate to be at any time revocable and bound by the mandat impeditif, formal instructions of his constituents. The few but important functions which would still remain for a central government were not to be suppressed, as has been intentionally misstated, but were to be discharged by communal and thereafter responsible agents. The unity of the nation was not to be broken, but on the contrary to be organized by communal constitution and to become a reality by the destruction of the state power, which claimed to be the embodiment of that unity independent of and superior to the nation itself from which it was but a parasitic excrescence. While the merely repressive organs of the old governmental power were to be amputated, its legitimate functions were to be wrested from authority usurping preeminence over society itself and restored to the responsible agents of society. Instead of deciding once in three or six years which member of the ruling class was to misrepresent the people in parliament, universal suffrage was to serve the people constituted in communes, as individual suffrage serves every other employer in the search for the workmen and managers in his business. And it is well known that companies, like individuals in matters of real business, generally know how to put the right man in the right place, and if they for once make a mistake, to redress it promptly. On the other hand, on the other hand, nothing could be more foreign to the spirit of the commune than to supersede universal suffrage by hierarchical investiture. It is generally the fate of completely new historical creations to be mistaken for the counterparts of older and even defunct forms of social life, to which they may bear a certain likeness. Thus, this new commune, which breaks with the modern state power, has been mistaken for a reproduction of the medieval communes which first preceded and afterward became the substratum of that very state power. The communal constitution has been mistaken for an attempt to break up into the federation of small states, as dreamt of by Montesquieu and the Girondins, that unity of great nations, which, if originally brought about by political force, has now become a powerful coefficient of social production. The antagonism of the commune against the state power has been mistaken for an exaggeration or an exaggerated form of the ancient struggle against over-centralization. Peculiar historical circumstances may have prevented the classical development, as in France, of the bourgeois form of government and may have allowed, as in England, to complete the great central state organs 
by corrupt vestries, jobbing counselors, and ferocious poor law guardians in the towns, and virtually hereditary magistrates in the counties. The communal constitution would have restored to the social body all the forces hitherto absorbed by the state parasite feeding upon and clogging the free movement of society. By this one act, it would have initiated the regeneration of France. The provincial French middle class saw in the commune an attempt to restore the sway their order had held over the country under Louis Philippe, and which under Louis, Louis, Louis Napoleon was supplanted by the pretended rule of the country over the towns. In reality, the communal constitution brought the rural producers under the intellectual lead of the central towns of their districts and there secured to them in the working men the natural trustees of their interests. The very existence of the commune involved as a matter of course, local municipal liberty, but no longer as a check upon the now superseded state power. It could only enter into the head of a Bismarck, who when not engaged on his intrigues of, blo of blood and iron, always likes to resume his old trade, so befitting his mental caliber of contributor to Clatterat, Clatteratach, the Berlin Punch. It could only enter into such a head to ascribe to the Paris Commune aspirations. After the caricature of the old French municipal organization of 1791, the Prussian municipal constitution, which degrades the town governments to mere secondary wheels in the police machinery of the Prussian state. The commune made the catchword of bourgeois revolutions, cheap government, a reality by destroying the two greatest sources of expenditure, the standing army and state functionar fun functionarism. Its very existence presupposed the non-existence of monarchy, which in Europe at least is the normal encumbrance and indispensable cloak of class rule. It supplied the Republic with the basis of really democratic institutions, but neither cheap government nor the true republic was its ultimate aim. They were its mere concomitants. The multiplicity, interpretation, the multiplicity of interpretations to which the commune has been subjected and the multiplicity, multiplicity of interests which construed it in their favor show that it was a thoroughly expansive political form. While well, the previous forms of government had been emphatically repressive, its true secret was this. It was essentially a working class government, the product of the struggle of the producing against the appropriating class, the political form at last discovered under which to work out the economical emancipation of labor. Except on this last condition, the communal constitution would have been an impossibility and a delusion. The political rule of the producer cannot coexist with the perpetuation of his social slavery. <clears throat> the commune was therefore to serve as a lever for uprooting the economical foundation upon which rests the existence of classes, and therefore of class rule. With labor emancipated, every man becomes a working man, and productive labor ceases to be a class tribute or class attribute. It is a strange, it is a strange fact. In spite of all the, t the tall talk and all the immense literature for the last 60 years about emancipation of labor, no sooner do the working men anywhere take the subject into their own hands with a will, than uprises at once all the apologetic phraseology of the mouthpieces of present society with its two poles of capital and wage slavery. The landlord now is but the sleeping partner of the capitalist. As if the capitalist society was still in its purest state of virgin innocence, with its antagonisms still undeveloped, with its delusions still unexploded, with its prostitute realities not yet laid bare. The commune, they exclaim, intends to abolish property, the basis of all civilization. Yes, gentlemen, the commune intended to abolish that class prop property which makes the labor of the many the wealth of a few. It aimed at the expropriation of the expropriators. It wanted to make individual property a truth by transforming the means of production, land, and capital 
now chiefly the means of enslaving and exploiting labor into mere instruments of free and associated labor. But this is communism, impossible communism. Why those members of the ruling classes who are intelligent enough to perceive the impossibility of continuing the present system, and they are many, have become the obtrusive and full-mouthed apostles of cooperative production. If cooperative production is not to remain a sham and a snare, if it is to supersede the capitalist system, if united cooperative societies are to regulate national production upon common plan, thus taking it under their own control and putting an end to the constant anarchy and periodical convulsions, which are the fatality of capitalist production, what else, gentlemen, would it be but communism, possible communism? The working class did not expect miracles from the commune. They have no ready-made utopias to introduce par décret du peuple. They know that in order to work out their own emancipation and along with it that higher form to which present society is irresistibly tending by its own economical agencies, they will have to pass through long struggles, through a series of historic processes transforming circumstances and men. They have no ideals to realize, but to set free the elements of the new society with which all collapsing bourgeois society itself is pregnant. In the full consciousness of their historic mission and with the heroic resolve to act up to it, the working class can afford to smile at the coarse invective of the gentleman's gentleman with pen and inkhorn and at the didactic patronage of well-wishing bourgeois doctrinaires pouring forth their ignorant platitudes and sectarian crotchets in the oracular tone of scientific infallibility. When the Paris Commune took the management of the revolution in its own hands, when plain working men for the first time dared to infringe upon the governmental privilege of their natural superiors and under circumstances of unexampled difficulty performed it at salaries the highest of which barely amounted to one-fifth of what, according to high scientific authority, is the minimum required for a secretary to a certain metropolitan school board. The old world writhed in convulsions of rage at the sight of the red flag, the symbol of the Republic of Labour, floating over the Hotel de Ville. And yet this was the first revolution in which the wor working class was openly acknowledged as the only class capable of social initiative even by the great bulk of the Paris middle class. Shopkeepers, tradesmen, merchants. The wealthy capitalist alone accepted. The commune had saved them by a sagacious settlement of that ever recurring cause of dispute among the middle class themselves, the debtor and creditor accounts. The same portion of the middle class after they had assisted in putting down the working men's insurrection of June, 1848, had been at once uncer unceremoniously sacrificed to their creditors by the then constituent assembly. But this was not their only motive for not rallying around the working class. They felt there was but one alternative, the commune or the empire, under whatever name it might appear. The empire had ruined them economically by the havoc it made of public wealth, by the wholesale financial swindling it fostered, by the props it lent to the artificially accelerated centralization of capital and the concomitant expropriation of their own ranks. It had suppressed them politically. It had shocked them morally by its orgies. It had ins insulted their Voltairianism by handing over the education of their children to the Fred Igno Ignorantin. It had revolted their national feeling as Frenchmen by precipitating them headlong into a war which left only one equivalent for the ruins it made, the disappearance of the empire. In fact, after the exodus from Paris of the high Bonapartist and capitalist Bohème, the true middle-class party of order came out in the shape of the Union Repu Republicaine, enrolling themselves under the colors of the commune and defending it against the willful misconstructions of theirs. Whether the gratitude of this great body of the middle class will stand, the present severe trial time must show. The commune was perfectly right in telling the peasants that its victory was their only hope. 
of all the lies hatched at Versailles and re-echoed by the glorious European penny A-liner. One of the most tremendous was that the rurals represented the French peasantry. Think only of the love of the French peasant for the men to whom, after 1815, he had to pay the milliard indemnity. In the eyes of the French peasant, the very existence of a great landed proprietor is in itself an encroachment on his conquests of 1789. The bourgeois in 1848 had burdened his plot of land with the additional tax of 45 cents in the franc, but then he did so in the name of the revolution. Well, now he had fomented a civil war against revolution to shift onto the peasant's shoulders the, the chief load of the five milliards of indemnity to be paid to the, Pru to the Prussian. The Commune, on the other hand, in one of its first proclamations, declared that the true originators of the war would be made to pay its cost. The Commune would have delivered the peasant of the blood tax, would have given him a cheap government, transformed his present bloodsuckers, the notary, advocate, executor, and other judicial vampires, into salaried communal agents, elected by and responsible to himself. It would have freed him of the tyranny of the garde champêtre, the gendarme and the prefect would have put enlightenment by the schoolmaster in the place of stultification by the priest, and the French peasant is, above all, a man of reckoning. He would find it extremely reasonable that the pay of the priest, instead of being extorted by the tax gatherer, should only depend upon the spontaneous action of the parishioner's religious instinct. Such were the great immediate boons which the rule of the commune, and that rule alone, held out to the French peasantry. It is therefore quite superfluous here to expatiate upon the, mo the more complicated but vital problems which the commune alone was able, and at the same time compelled to solve in, paper in favor of the peasant. The hypothecary debt lying like an incubus upon his parcel of soil, the rural proletariat daily growing upon it, and his expropriation from it enforced at a more and more rapid rate by the very development of modern agriculture and the competition of capitalist farming. The French peasant had elected Louis Bonaparte president of the Republic, but the party of order created the empire. What the French peasant really wants, he, com he commenced to show in 1849 and 1850 by opposing his mayor to the government's prefect, his schoolmaster to the governor's priest, and himself to the government's gendarme. All the laws made by the party of order in January and February 1850 were avowed measures of repression against the peasant. The peasant was a Bonapartist, because the great revolution, with all its benefits to him, was, in his eyes, personified in Napoleon. This delusion, rapidly breaking down under the Second Empire, and in its very nature hostile to the rurals, this prejudice of the past, how could it have withstood the appeal of the commune to the living interests and urgent wants of the peasantry? The rurals, this was in fact their chief apprehension, knew that three months free co uh, communication of communal, communal Paris with the provinces would bring about a general rising of the peasants, and hence their anxiety to establish a police blockade around Paris so as to stop the spread of the rinderpest, cattle pest, contagious disease. If the commune was thus the true representative of all the healthy elements of French society, and therefore the truly national government, it was, at the same time, as a working men's government, as the bold champion of the emancipation of labor, emphatically international. Within sight of that Prussian army that had annexed to Germany two French provinces, the commune annexed to France the working people all over the world. The Second Empire had been the jubilee of cosmopolitan blackleggism, the rakes of all countries rushing in at its call for a share in its orgies and end in the plunder of the French people. Even at this moment, the right hand of Thierse is Ginesco, the foul Wallachian, and his left hand is Markovsky, the Russian spy. The commune admitted all foreigners to the honor of dying for an immortal cause. Between the foreign war lost by their treason and the civil war fomented by their conspiracy with the foreign invader, the bourgeoisie had found the time to display their patriotism by
by organizing police hunts upon the Germans in France. The commune made a German working man, Leo Frankel, its minister of labor. Fierce, the bourgeoisie, the Second Empire, had continually deluded Poland by loud professions of sympathy, while in reality betraying her to and doing the dirty work of Russia. The commune honored the heroic sons of Poland, J. Dabrowski and W. Robluski, by placing them at the head of the defenders of Paris. And to broadly mark the new era of history, it was conscious of initiating under the eyes of the conquering Prussians on one side and the Bonapartist army led by Bonapartist generals on the other, the commune pulled down that colossal symbol of martial glory, the Vendome Column. The great social measure of the commune was its own working existence. Its special measures could but betoken the tendency of a government of the people by the people. Such were the abolition of the night work of journeyman bakers, the prohibition under penalty of the employer's practice to reduce wages by levying upon their workpeople fines under manifold pretexts, a process in which the employer combines in his own person the parts of legislator, judge, and executor, the filch, the money to boot. Another measure of this class was the surrender to associations of workmen under reserve of compensation of all closed workshops and factories, no matter whether the respective capitalists had absconded or preferred to strike work. The financial measures of the commune, remarkable for their sagacity and moderation, could only be such as were compatible with the state of a besieged town. Considering the colossal robberies committed upon the city of Paris by the great financial companies and contractors, under the protection of Haussmann, the commune would have had an incomparably better title to confiscate their property than Louis Napoleon had against the Orleans family. The Hohenzollern and the English oligarchs, who both have derived a good deal of their estates from church plunders, were, of course, greatly shocked at the commune clearing but 8,000 F out of secularization. While the Versailles government, as soon as it had recovered some spirit and strength, used the most violent means against the commune, while it put down the free expression of opinion all over France, even to the forbidding of meetings of delegates from the large towns, while it subjected Versailles and the rest of France to an espionage far surpassing that of the Second Empire, while it burned its gendarme inquisitors all papers printed at Paris, and sifted all correspondence from and to Paris, while in the National Assembly, the most timid attempts to put in a word for Paris were held down in a manner unknown even to the Chambre Introuvable of 1816. With the savage warfare of, Versa of Versailles outside and its attempts at corruption and conspiracy inside Paris, would the Commune not have shamefully betrayed its trust by affecting to keep all the decencies and appearances of liberalism as in a time of profound peace? Had the government of the Commune been akin to that of M. Thiers, there would have been no more occasion to suppress party of order papers at Paris that there was to suppress communal papers at Versailles. It was irritating indeed to the rurals that at the very same time they declared the return to the church to be the only means of salvation for France. The infidel commune unearthed the peculiar mysteries of the Picpus nunnery and of the Church of St. Laurent. It was a satire upon M. Thiers that, while he showered grand crosses upon the Bonapartist generals in acknowledgement of their mastery in losing battles, signing capitulations and turning cigarettes at Wilhelm Show, the commune dismissed and arrested its generals whenever they were suspected of neglecting their duties. The expulsion from and arrest by the commune of one of its members, Blanchette, who had slipped in under a false name and had undergone at Lyon six days imprisonment for simple bankruptcy, was it not a deliberate insult hurled at the forger, Jules Favre, when still the foreign minister of France, still selling France to Bismarck, and still dictating his orders to that paragon government of Belgium. But indeed the commune did not pretend to infallibility, the invariable at attribute of all governments of the old stamp. 
It published its doings and sayings. It initiated the public into all of its shortcomings. In every revolution, there intrude at the side of its true agents, men of different stamp. Some of them survivors of and devotees to past revolutions without insight into the present movement, but preserving popular influence by their known honesty and courage or by the sheer force of tradition. Others, mere brawlers who, by dint of repeating year after year the same set of stereotyped declarations against the government of the day, have sneaked into the reputation of revolutionists of the first water. After March 18th, some such men did also turn up and in some cases contrived to play preeminent parts. As far as their power went, they hampered the real action of the working class, exactly as men of that sort have hampered the full development of every previous revolution. They are an unavoidable evil. With time, they are shaken off, but time was not allowed to the commune. Wonderful indeed was the change the commune had wrought in Paris. No longer any race of the meretricious Paris of the Second Empire. No longer was Paris the rendezvous of British landlords, Irish absentees, American ex-slave holders and shoddy men, Russian ex-surf owners and Wallachian boyards. No more corpses at the morgue, no nocturnal burglaries, scarcely any robberies. In fact, for the first time since the days of February 1848, the streets of Paris were safe, and that without any police of any kind. We, said a member of the Commune, hear no longer of assassination, theft, and personal assault. It seems indeed as if the police had dragged along with it to Versailles all its conservative friends. The cocottes, um, chickens or prostitutes, had refound the scent of their protectors the absconding men of family, religion, and above all, of property. In their stead, the real women of Paris showed again at the surface, heroic, noble, and devoted like the women of antiquity. Hmm. Working, thinking, fighting, bleeding Paris, almost forgetful in its incubation of a new society, of the cannibals at its gates, radiant in the enthusiasm of its historic initiative. Opposed to this new world at Paris, behold the old world at Versailles, that assembly of the ghouls of all defunct regimes, legitimists and Orleanists, eager to feed upon the carcass of the nation, with a tale of antediluvian republicans sanctioning by their presence in the assembly the slaveholders' rebellion, relying for the maintenance of their parliamentary republic upon the vanity of the senile mountbank at its head, and caricaturing 1789 by holding their ghastly meetings in the Jeu de Pomme. There it was, this assembly, the representative of everything dead in France, propped up to the semblance of life by nothing but the swords of the generals of Louis Bonaparte. Paris, all truth, Versailles, all lie, and that lie vented through the mouth of Thierse. Thierse tells a deputation of the mayors of the Seine et Oise, you may rely upon my word, which I have never broken. He tells the assembly itself that it was the most freely elected and most liberal assembly France ever possessed. He tells his motley soldiery, soldiery that it was the admiration of the world and the finest army France ever possessed. He tells the provinces that the bombardment of Paris by him was a myth. If some cannon shots have been fired, it was not the deed of the army of Versailles, but of some insurgents trying to make believe that they are fighting while they dare not show their faces. He again tells the provinces that the artillery of Versailles does not bombard Paris, but only can cannonades it. He tells the Archbishop, Archbishop of Paris that the pretended ex executions and reprisals attributed to the Versailles troops were all moonshine. He tells Paris that he was only anxious to free it from the hideous tyrants who oppress it and that, in fact, the Paris of the Commune was but a handful of criminals. The Paris of M. Thierse was not the real Paris of the vile multitude, but a phantom Paris, the Paris of the Franc Fleur, the Paris of the boulevards, male and female, the rich, the capitalist, the gilded, the idle Paris, now thronging with its lackeys, its blacklegs, its literacy bonhomme, or its literary bonhomme, and its cocottes at Versailles, Saint-Denis, Roy and St. Germain. 
considering the Civil War but an agreeable diversion, eyeing the battle going on through telescopes, counting the rounds of cannon, swearing by their own honor and that of their prostitutes that the performance was far better got up than it used to be at the Port St. Martin. The men who fell were really dead. The cries of the wounded were cries in good earnest. And besides, the whole thing was so intensely historical. This is the Paris of M. Thiers, as the emigration of Coblenz was the France of M. de Cologne.